So welcome, welcome, welcome to the Tough and Notary introductory talk. I'm Justin Kapos, a professor at NYU. I'm Justin Komak, engineer at Docker. Right, and um, Tough and Notary, just super quick, uh, Tough is a specification for how to do updates and things securely that's used in a lot of different uh, domains. And the main implementation that's used in the cloud is Notary, which is what uh, uh, Justin Cormack and others at Docker did. So what uh, I'm going to be doing is I'll start off and tell you a little bit, tell you a little bit about Tough and things like that itself. And then we'll hand over a little later on, and Justin Cormack will show you some cool demos and things like that. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so since I'm a professor, uh, one of the things that I get to do is I get to give like pop quizzes. Right? It's one of these like kind of rights that you get along with, you know, how they issue you the tweed jacket with like the elbow patches and the pipe and all that. Um, so there's an attack vector um, that's used by hackers all around the world. It bypasses network defenses like firewalls and things like this. Uh, it, you can use it to hack basically anything, any type of device, everything from cloud systems, supercomputers, uh, you know, phones. Uh, you can use it to hack little embedded devices, cars, like just any, any device you can imagine. Um, and it's already been used many, many, many times by the best uh, hackers in the world uh, when they want to go and launch an attack against actually an adversary that's supposed to have good defenses. So anybody know what this attack vector is? Yes. It's not weak passwords. It's not people. It's updaters. It's software updates. So when you look at it and you look historically at attacks that have, that have happened uh, for nation state actors going after this, how did allegedly the United States and allegedly Israel take down the centrifuges in Iran, attacks through the software update mechanism? How um, did um, allegedly Russia go and you know, mess around in ME doc and bring down 90% of the companies in Ukraine and cause a lot of collateral damage, software update based attacks. How did North Korea go and launch attacks on South Korea and cost three quarters of a billion dollars of damage, uh, software update attacks, all right? And there've been many, many victims of this. So, um, you know, these are, are companies that if I just had put these logos up here and asked you what do they have in common, you'd think they have great security teams, they're really focused, you know, they know what they're doing. Um, but it turns out that it is very hard to protect against these types of attacks because you effectively have to be perfect. And once someone gets in your software update infrastructure, if they can sign malicious releases, then that, you know, that's running on your user devices, usually as root, because it's the thing that is used to update your kernel. And so if an attacker can get in there, you know, people like to think of buffer overflows and SQL injection and all these other types of attacks and, ah, uh, you know, um, you know, we'll have all these ROP defenses and we'll use ASLR and we'll do all this fancy stuff. But if you can just get into their software update infrastructure, you've won. That's it. All right. Um, so when some people start to look at this, they just say, oh, but it's, you know, it's easy. You just sign things and everything just works. Just like, hey, you know, I have uh, a lock for my bike. So I just put the lock around the bike and I attach it to something and everything's good, right? Um, but that, you know, that isn't actually, uh, unfortunately, how, how things work in the, in the first case. It isn't that for the companies here, it isn't that they didn't have crypto. It's that they, had, they weren't doing the right things with their crypto. They weren't protecting against the right types of attacks. They weren't um, signing the right things, protecting keys in the appropriate way, and making it so that they could recover if something went wrong. So does a simple solution work? Could we just, you know, go and you know, make everybody retrieve things over HTTPS, and is that just a solution? So all that this is doing, whether you have pinned your certificates or whether you have this plugged into the main CA system, is at best it's saying you're talking to the right server, okay? But it doesn't say that if that server is compromised uh, that your clients are safe. So if you break into the server, then all your, comp all, all your clients are, are now under the control of the attacker potentially. Um, so this is one way some organizations have been hacked. The other way is, is that people like to use uh, GPG signing uh, in different ways. So maybe now they have, one way to do this is to have every developer go and have keys. And uh, then, oh, you know, well, it has to be signed by a developer, but then it turns out that you usually end up with like 100 plus developers that all have, 
have the ability to do this because the person who needs to push the Polish language pack has to have the ability to sign this. Um, and so he's trusted to push changes to the root kernel or to the, to the kernel of the system, Linux kernel, other things like that. So any of these developers is now a weak spot that can compromise all your users. Alternately, if you go and you have some kind of build server where you think I'm being really smart, I'm putting my key in an HSM or some other kind of hardware device so nobody can tamper with it, um, well, that will get you on that first page as well as, as a lot of the companies that are found. Because um, really, uh, then all that has to happen is uh, someone can get into your build server and give you uh, something malicious that you then trust and sign and get out there. Um, so keeping your key, even if they can't exfiltrate your key, it doesn't matter. If they can use your key to sign something malicious, that's good enough. Like who cares if they get, you know, if they take the key away, yes, that's extra bad. But, but saying, oh, they could only use it while they were, while they were in my box is not reassuring enough. Um, okay. So it's not easy to do this. It's not like a trivial thing to do. Um, and in fact, the initial way that this tough project came about is I had done uh, some work looking at um, security issues with Linux package managers. And some folks from the Tor project uh, read about my work and said, uh-oh, our Tor updater has a lot of these issues too. So they came out and they spent a few days with me um, when I was at the University of Washington and we jotted out a uh, rough design. They went away and did a design and asked uh, me and an undergraduate who I was working with to look at it. And we found like seven serious security problems in their design. So we said, wait a minute, you know, we can't just kind of write, you know, be an academic and write a paper and say, you need to do these things. We have to actually provide a better way forward. So what we did um, instead is to come up with a, a specification and reference implementation and things that describe exactly how to do updates in a secure way across a very wide variety of domains. And that's what Tough is all about. So the goal of Tough is to be uh, compromise resilient. So this means that an attacker goes and breaks into part of your infrastructure and it doesn't uh, mean that they sort of have access to everything. It's not like a single server that fails or a single key that's lost. Uh, you have to have sort of a bunch of issues come together to have a serious impact of users. So someone breaks into your server, your clients are still okay. Um, the other main philosophy of Tough is to support and not be judgmental. So in other words, um, what we, we know that a lot of your infrastructure looks like this, okay? Um, and Tough is not uh, like, you know, thou shalt, um, only like have an infrastructure that looks the way we say with brand X servers that are running brand Y operating system and using brand Z crypto. Tough is instead describing um, like the, the, the way in which you need to go through to build and set things up and configure it. And um, one of the things that you'll, you'll hear about a little bit later here is the way that Docker's done it. If you come to the deep dive, you'll learn more about how other companies like Datadog and automotive vendors and others that are using Tough have deployed it in fairly different ways that all still uh, comply with the spec and all still get the same security guarantees. Uh, all right, so uh, in order, you know, Tough itself, the easiest way I find to explain it to people rather than talking really technically about um, like how, what the metadata format looks like or any of those types of things. I want to talk uh, first about the design uh, principles, the things that went into Tough, the concepts that Tough uses to make it have security. So you can understand at that level. And then, you know, we can talk about things like what do the file, like what's the file format look like and how do signatures work and things like that. So responsibility separation. This is a concept where what you do is you have different roles that are trusted to do different things. And so a role uh, might be trusted only to do things like say, has there been an update in the last uh, few hours? That's the only thing the, the role is trusted to do is to say, yes, there's been an update or no, there hasn't been an update, right? And so if an attacker can go and compromise that role, that has a very different impact than a role that's allowed to do things like sign a release of a package. So, uh, uh, you know, there's different roles that have different responsibilities in the system. Uh, and in fact, that's the example I just gave here, so let me skip that. Um, and then another thing to uh, focus on in Tough is, is that if you think about the damage you can have from a compromise in a system, 
the damage is roughly, you know, the probability of that compromise occurring times the impact of, of that compromise. So if you have, you know, so for instance, it's very unlikely that a massive meteor is going to go and crash into the earth in the middle of this talk, right? It's very, very unlikely, at least I, I hope. Um, <laughs> and, but the impact would be massive. Like this would be, you know, this is something that would, would definitely be, curtail the talk. Yes, yes. <laughs> would throw me off my off my game for a slide or two at least. Um, so, uh, but the expected damage from that is vanishingly small because the probability is very small. But um, the chance that like my mouth is going to get dry and I really find I need some water, you know, is is probably pretty probable. Um, but the impact of that is pretty low. I just maybe sound a little croakier than I should as I give my talk, right? So you, you want to make it so that um, you know things that are likely to happen, keys that are likely to be compromised and tough, are unlikely to cause any substantial damage when compromised, and keys that would cause substantial damage are very unlikely to be compromised. And I'll talk about how that works in a moment. So for instance, um, we have a role called the root role. The root role is uh, sort of the, the root of all trust in the system. And usually, this isn't a single key. In fact, I'm not aware of a tough deployment model that that uses a uh, you know that uses this it's basically uh, organizations go and they have a collection of UB keys or other things like this that they keep in safety deposit boxes and you have to you know an attacker would have to mission impossible style break into you know f like three or four safes all at once like spread around the world and then get those keys out in order to be able to to uh, you know to compromise the root role um, whereas you have a key like this time, you know, this, this role that tells you, has there been an update in the last hour? Well, that key is going to be kept on a server for sure. Uh, it's, it's going to be there. It might, maybe it's in an HSM or something, but it's still going to be in a server that's online and still is vulnerable to an attack. So if someone's able to compromise that key, then they can lie and say, oh, there hasn't been an update when maybe there has been one. There was an update, you know, um, an hour ago, but you can say, no, 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 there hasn't been one. Okay. But that impact is much less than being able to root all of the, the users. Um, uh, Tough also supports multiple signatures. You can have thresholds. You can say that some number, you know, T of N for whatever values of T and N you like are required for trust. You can say one of three. You can say, you know, nine out of ten, whatever makes sense for your domain. And you can use this in lots of different places. So you don't have to have a single person just like you, know, you have the two keys in the submarine that have to be turned together. Um, you set it up for whatever makes sense for your uh, environment, depending on how forgetful your users are, how often they lose their keys, and how secure you need to be. Um, right, so I'll just go and skip. Yep, so, and then um, one thing that I think you see very common across security systems uh, that is really a telling thing about how secure, like how much you should trust the system, is how much did people spend thinking about revocation? How much did they spend thinking about what happens when things go wrong? Okay? Because there's, there are a ton of systems out there that sort of after the fact, someone said, oh yeah, we need to think about this revocation problem and we need to think a lot harder than we have been. But in practice, whether it's people losing keys, accidentally disclosing key material, um, hackers breaking in, these things happen, right? So if you're going to have a system that's secure, you need to think very carefully about that. So Tuff today has uh, two mechanisms, explicit and implicit revocation. Explicit revocation is a mechanism by which uh, you can go and say, like, effectively, this key isn't trusted anymore. Instead, trust another key. Um, implicit revocation is a way of saying that this key will expire after this date. So it's a way of making it even if you have situations where uh, you know, you're being blocked from receiving updates. And by the way, this does happen in some countries with oppressive regimes. They stop their users from getting updates so they can more easily uh, compromise those users. Then you can have the user at least be aware of this and be warned that they're not getting this information because, hey, your keys have expired. They should have been rotated out by now. All right, uh, t so Tuff itself has four different roles. There's the root role that serves as the root of trust and indicates keys for all the other roles. There's a role called the targets role or the projects role um, that goes and delegates in, uh, you know, it delegates to the actual things you want to install. So whether this is software images or 
uh, packages or whether this is something like disk images for embedded devices, whatever else, it actually points to those. And uh, targets roles, by the way, can further sub-delegate out to others so you don't have to kind of have one big signing role. You can break it down and say, Joe is able to, you know, um, there are these, you know, there's this role for this piece of software that we produce with this name and this uh, piece of software can be built by Joe and Sam and Sally and stuff like that. And then when Sam rotates out, you can replace Sam with Alice or whoever the new person is. And they can't go and, you know, then push changes to the Linux kernel if that's not part of what they're supposed to be signing for. There's a role called Snapshot, which I can talk in more detail about, um, but it, it basically, I, I will talk a little more about in the deep dive, but basically it makes sure that no one is kind of cherry picking pieces of metadata out of a repository. One of the things that um, I, I did in some of the early work I did with package manager security was I found ways to convince clients that any, because if somebody signed something, they've signed it and people don't rotate their keys that often. So I found you could take like a four-year-old version of SendMail and uh, give it to clients and they would think it was like up to date or give them really outdated things like that, which is really bad. Um, so Snapshot uh, in, in Tough um, protects against that. It makes it so that that sorts of issues can't occur. And Timestamp goes and uh, determines when updates have occurred. So uh, Tough is used in practice by a lot of different groups. Um, you can see, you know, once again, the company logo slide that everybody seems to love to have. Um, and uh, one way that we go and we build and we improve things with Tough is not only through our reference implementation, which is used in production, but is only probably used in production by maybe 10% of the devices that run Tough in the world. Um, the way to get changes in that are more impactful is to work through us to change the actual specification as um, we've had many different people do. I don't know how many different organizations and, and groups, but it's, it's, um, it's, you know, these taps here I think have something like, um, like 10 different authors from, uh, from like eight different organi you know, organizations represented as part of this. And uh, they deal with a lot of uh, the issues that uh, we've addressed and, and uh, have had things come, a lot of them from the Docker community, from Quay, others in the cloud native space, from folks in the automotive space, um, from others that are, are using this out of the programming language community. Uh, and if you're interested you know, in um, doing this, then uh, we would love to have a conversation with you and, and love to work with you and learn about your use case because Tough is really meant to be able to slot in to basically anything and work well. So if you think you have a challenging use case, then that sounds super fun to me. I'm, I'm very stoked about that. So um, and talking about a really awesome use case, I'll now switch over and let Justin Cormack take it. So yeah. Um I'm going to talk about Notary. I'm mostly going to show you what it's like to use Notary as a tool on its own. Um, but a bit of background. So Notary is a tough implementation um, that we originally did at Docker um, three of um, three. I think I think we launched three years ago now, um, and um, it's written in Go. It has a lot of maintainers from different companies. Um, and it's basically designed, I mean, the use case for which Docker built it was to run it at scale in conjunction with um, a registry. So we run it alongside Docker Hub as a public notary instance that anyone can use for signing uh, containers on Docker Hub. Um, and so, so it's designed for that kind of use case, but it's in fact built as a, you know, just a Go tough library that you can use for other use cases as well. So um, it's, it's, Pretty reusable code if you if you want to do something different with it. Um, it's um, basically designed around um, because it's designed to run at scale. It's it's it stores everything in a database or two databases. One for there's two pieces of it. There's the notary server that um, serves up the notary metadata, which has one database, and then there's the um, the signer, which does things like online timestamp updates and so on, which can use a separate database. Um, if you, and and though you can basically replicate both the signer and the server as they all their states in the database, and then you can you can use um, 
a scale out database layer as well to, to serve those. Um, so I'm, I'm really just going to show you uh, what it's like to kind of run it on your, I'm just going to run it on my laptop. Um, we're just going to write, use Docker Compose to bring it up. And I'm going to basically just um, um, is it yeah yeah I'm, actually it's, it's, when I, once that's come up um, I'll just switch to this oops other tab and then we'll just let's uh, make that nice and big uh, just have we finished uh, that looks like everything might be up ish yeah so. Um, so we're just going to basically do a kind of really, really, really simple demo of just putting some stuff in. So um, Notary divides things into repositories. So we're going to create a repository called test. Um, and this is going to helpfully tell us that um, I'm just going to use this to cut and paste the same password for everything. Uh, I'm not going to use a secure password. I'm just going to use one that you can all read. So, um, so this is the root. The root signing key, which I'm just doing locally, I'm not using a Yubi key or anything, so it's kind of going to be um, on my disk. I'm just going to give it the root password, and then we're going to create all the other keys with the same password, so it's easier to do the demos. Notice that there's no timestamp key here because Notary always manages the timestamps itself, um, and we're going to um, so we can just. Notary, the Notary tool itself has a model where you stage things locally and then publish them. So we can we can publish tests up to the um, up to the actual server. Um, we have to give our um, passwords for the keys because the keys are encrypted. Um, and then we've basically just um, created an empty repository, no targets, very straightforward. So let's. Um, I've got a couple of files here. I'm just going to um, I'm going to add file to test um, to as I'm going to call this v1 for version one. Oops. Um, hold on. That's why that's why I decided to cut and to have this. Uh, I've got my arguments in the wrong order. Let's, sorry. Um, so we've uh, we've added a file to there and we can um, publish that and um, put our password in and and at this point we can we can list this and it'll tell us there's one file in it and it'll tell us the, di the version number and the digest and if we um, if we actually just check the file itself we can check that the um, that is in fact the the SHA-256 sum of that file. Um, and we can also, um, we'll just, um, we, um, we can also just use this to verify that this file, so we can basically ask Notary to test whether this file is in fact um, the file that we pushed, and it just passes through, but if we, um, Notice that Notary doesn't itself um, actually store um, the actual file data at all. It's expecting you to put it in a registry or some other storage. So Notary is just, um, um, it's just basically, uh, it's basically just going to check against the file that we've got locally, which ha was the same one. If I modify this file, it will tell me, no, this does not match. So very straightforward. It's going to say, this checksum does not match. The SHA-256 didn't match. All kind of all kind of broken. If if we then go, we can look inside what's in the MySQL database for this. Um, and I've got a couple of queries saved. So this um, this query selects all the um, all the files that have been stored, and you can see that um, we've got the different roles, and each of them has a version. So every time we push an update, we've updated these versions. So we can go and um, look, for example, inside version three of the targets. And we can look at the, um, oh, hold on, uh, no, not the, we can look at the blob that's um, it's sort of the MySQL blob, look at the JSON, and we can see that we've got our target called V1 here. We have its length, and we have 
SHA-256 and SHA-512 hashes of it. Uh, do the Docker actually only uses SHA-256 hashes, but the notary program actually stores both by default if you use it directly. All the kind of configuration of um, hash which hashes and signatures you actually use is all fairly all fairly configurable in the code if you want to um, use different types of, types of signatures and so on. And then we've got the signatures on um, on this on this blob as well. So you can see it's been signed by this particular key ID. And if we look at the root role here, we can go and see all the um, what all the different key IDs are. Again, every file is signed. Um, so you can validate that file that you've downloaded and then you can see the, these are all the different keys. And here it tells us what the, what the, um, what, which role each key that's listed here has. And then we can go and um, we can rotate keys by hand. Uh, so we can, um, there's two options when we're rotating keys. We can either, um, if you use the minus R option that says, this is a remote key, this is not stored locally, but I want to rotate the timestamp key that's on the server. Um, and we need to obviously give the passphrase for our root key so that we can update that and the snapshot key. And then it will have rotated the timestamp key. And if we refresh this, we've, you can see we've got a new timestamp role has been created. All the other roles are still in the database and they get stored so you can you can and you can retrieve them by their hash as well depending on from the content hash. So if someone broke into your server that just effectively fixed the fact that they may have lied to your users about what was up to date. So. And we yeah and we can rotate all the keys so we can rotate the um, we can rotate the root rotate the root key. This is I got an are you sure warning on it on the command line because um, it's uh, it's not something you want to do very often. Um, and then we can, um, but we can enter the passphrase for the new root key, and we need to update it there. So we've got that. And if we look now here, um, we've got a new root here, root here, and if we. Um, take a look at the actual data for this, we can see that we've got two signatures here now on this root key, one with the original root key and one with the new root key. Um, so you can check it and you can, as a, as a part of the process where the, um, when the when the client is actually checking these, it, it'll go and actually check from the root key it had before. Um, it'll check the, the this and, and update the new root key, but so it needs both the signatures in order to do that. Um, we can also, um, um, you can also, you, it's, Notary just has a very straightforward REST API, so we can go and, um, if we have the right certs, we can just go and retrieve these, um, all these directly from using the REST API. Um, yeah, we, by default, there's no, um, if you just run Notary on its own, it doesn't have any authorization. It would normally, if you're running it on, the, the instance running on Docker Hub, everything's sitting behind authorization as well, but it's actually, if you're just testing it on its own and there's no authorization, so it's, you, can, you can retrieve all the, all the keys and so you can see the, um, um, you can see the root key there with, these, with the two signatures um, that we have, now we've rotated them. Um, and um, um, so, so we can see the case there. And we can also retrieve um, a specific um, version. So, if we um, if we want, we can go and retrieve. If we look at the, for example, the snapshot role, um, um, inconveniently, the snapshot role has the hashes as um, base sixty four encoded. But we can see that this this snapshot is pointing at the. Um, of this target root key that we can, and we can, if we O64 decode that, then we can retrieve the, um, we can retrieve the, uh, um, we can retrieve the actual version of, um, the exact version of, of the role that the snapshot key is pointing at. If we just, um, that is, 
that's the actual SHA-256 hash, and we can retrieve, um, that was a snapshot key, so that was, sorry, that was the target's key, and we can retrieve that particular version of the target's tree. So that's that's the way, so if you know the hash of the, uh, the JSON file, you can actually retrieve directly a specific version. So um, you can get you can get the consistent snapshot. And so this is the particular version that that was pointing at. Um, so and that's, that's we can we can add in um, we can add in more files. Um, so we can just add um, we can add a v we can add a v two we can add file two as version. Two, um, and then we can publish that, and then we, um, oops, um, and it, um, and we have a, then we have a separate. We, then we, if we look at the refreshed version of this, we can get the the new um, updated targets, and we can see we've got a, uh, we've now got. Um, V1 and V2 in here, um, so we can basically add add as many targets as we like. Um, we can also um, we can also do things that like we can ask Notary to um, rotate the. We can uh, ask Notary to manage the um, snapshot keys as well, so we don't have to put them in every time. Um, so we can we can tell it we want remote snapshot keys instead of managing them ourselves, um, and and so there, so which is actually the default on Docker Hub now. So if we then add add more things, um, we basically will only be asked. Oops, uh, will only be asked to um, for the targets key. And we won't be asked for the snapshot key anymore. So now Notary is actually managing the snapshot key, which, which is what we do on Docker Hub. So it's got the ability that you can decide which keys you want to you want to be automatically managed by the Notary server and which ones you want to manage locally. Um, but the timestamp key is always managed on the server with with the current Notary setup. Yeah, most most deployments will end up automating everything that's lower than the targets rule basically almost never sign anything yourself manually with snapshot. So usually as when you push a release as a developer, you sign one thing with your key that is actually only for you. Um, so it's not that dissimilar to, for instance, signing a Git commit. It's yeah. basically the same process. So, so someone with a root key will configure the different developers for that repo, right. and then they will sign the targets that they're allowed to sign themselves and, and the root key won't be needed unless you need to add a new developer. Right. Yeah. And the targets, you often have a hierarchy of targets keys and they're, the roles that are are further up the hierarchy are not needed unless, for instance, um, you change the developers that are allowed to release something or you add a new project you're going to release or something like that. And then you use it once. Um, we've probably got some some time for questions. I think. Yes, I think. Uh, what? what? Yes, oh yes, last slide. Yes, oh, yes. We added the last. Um, okay. hold, hold on just a sec. I'll repeat that in a sec. But I. Hear. So uh, let me just wrap up one quick second, and we'll get right to your question. So, uh, if you're interested in finding out more about Tough and Notary, we have a deep dive on Thursday. Uh, it also is going to discuss supply chain attacks, like how to stop people that go and tamper with your Git uh, repository or get into your build system or do other things like this. Uh, and if you want to find more information, you can find us on github.com uh, at uh, slash the update framework. And uh, our email addresses are here. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. And I'm sorry, can you say your question again so I can repeat it? Right. So the, the question is, is that is there any kind of integration that's done with Jenkins, Bamboo, or CI/CD pipelines? Um, so we actually 
uh, for the it, supply chain security stuff, we actually have an official uh, Jenkins plugin that works as part of that. Um, and you can go and, and trivially integrate any of the stuff that, that we're doing here into whatever your pipeline is. Tough and notary kind of work at the point where your software is already made and has come out of something like a CI, CD system. And then they take it that last mile securely and make sure nothing happens. So the things, you know, the CI, CD system, um, usually like the output of that is the input into Tough and Notary, but if you want something more holistic, then come to the deep dive and, and you'll learn more yeah, about it. Yeah, I mean, on the other, from, from Docker's point of view, all this notary stuff is totally hidden inside Docker. We've now got a whole set of separate Docker commands called Docker Trust, which you can manage all the notary stuff for. And, and, um, and, and so none of this is really visible for a Docker if you're, if you're just signing, you know, if you're just signing containers and things like that, it's, you don't need to, you don't really need to uh, understand all the details of how this works internally. And it's all kind of integrated into the registry. I mean, we, and we, yeah, we, we certainly, we have Jenkins integration for signing and the containers that we build and, and so on and the, and all the Docker official containers are all signed and so on. So that's all, that's all integrating with Docker rather than with Notary and Tuff directly. Um, and we've, we've, um, for for most purposes, you want to try and integrate it at a level where it's not 100% visible to users. I think. In in fact, uh, I often don't know who's using Tough. Sometimes I find out because they had an attack and Tough preve prevented the attack, and then it's like, oh, hey, cool. Now we can add them to our adopters page, but we had no idea ahead of time for that. So if you are using it, please tell me. Like I, I'd like to. Like put your company logo up there and, and say awesome things about you. So just just let us know. Yes. So what is the integration into Kubernetes? Is there some way that notary can prevent unsigned images from getting stored? There are various admission controllers. Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. So integration into Kubernetes can can you prevent unsigned image running in Kubernetes and so on? There are some admission control. There was a talk by IBM at KubeCon EU uh, last time about an, uh, where they built, had built an admission controller. Um, we have um, a bunch of admission control stuff as part of Docker Enterprise. Um, I think that it's um, it's something that we definitely there's definitely more interest in. I think the IBM one is kind of good a starting point, but I think there's a bunch more work to do, and it's something that I'm looking at at the moment as to exactly what we want to do for that. I think there's, um, and we're also working on a bunch of stuff with um, Docker App and CNAB and things like that. that show. Um, but for Docker App, which um, we really want to I incorporate um, uh, signing as part, and as part of the update process for applications. Yes. So, uh, given the timestamp, okay. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, is that what do you do about situations where you have a device that's going to be connected and then maybe offline for a while and then be connected again? Like, for instance, a submarine or maybe a car. Maybe you go and you park your car in storage for a while and don't turn it on or things like that. Um, how, how do you deal with that? Because maybe this timestamp key has been rotated. So, in situ so the answer to that is, is that in situations where you go and you do that update, you actually once you see something doesn't match with your timestamp role, you'll go and retrieve the root role. And the root role uh, will have a chain of trust from the root role you trusted of signatures to the new one, and that new root role will point to the new timestamp role. So you'll be able to go and validate your way through it using those keys. But you're correct that if you just only trusted exactly timestamp first and did things that way, you would have a problem, but Tuff has taken care of that for you. Yes? Yeah. Okay. 
Right, okay. So the question is, is that now if we modify the example that before you go underwater, you've prefetched the information yet, uh, you know, so you have like effectively a copy of the repository, a copy of the things you might want to install, but you have decided not to install them yet. You're going to do so later. Then what happens? How does this work? Um, okay, so you presumably as an operator in that point understand that your timestamp and other things like that are not going to be up to date. And if you, you know, are aware of that and say, yes, I want to use this expired snapshot of metadata I had it, have at this time, you can freely go and install and do whatever you like in this scenario. That, the, but if the, you're a, sorry, go ahead. The, the default behavior in Docker is if you're off, offline and you have, but you have the images locally and you install them, it'll use the cached things. But it will, if you're, if if it can't reach the server, you're offline and the timestamps have expired, it will still install them. Right, you, exactly. It'll give you a warning. Yeah. It'll say timestamps to expire, but it will actually. We decided right. that was a better behavior for that case. Right. So there's so in different implementations of Tuff, it's handled a little bit differently for how it warns you and whether you have to put a yes, yes, I really know what I'm doing flag or something like that. But in general, if you're not able to go and contact the server and do things like that, then the implementations I'm aware of have a mechanism to let you go and handle the submarine case. Uh, yes. Okay, so the question is, is that let's say you're offline and then a revocation happens. What, what is the, what, what's gonna happen to the client? You know, what are the concerns you should have? Um, if a revocation happens, then you obviously won't know about it, right? And if you're telling it, this is the danger of the submarine case saying, yes, go ahead and use this, but, but hopefully what has happened at that point is you got a good set of information that hadn't been tampered with a bad guy came in and stole a key and messed around with something. And then you haven't done an update since. So the bad guy hasn't had a chance to talk to you. If the bad guy's in the submarine with you, putting files into your notary repository, then you're in, you're in trouble in that case. I, I grant you that. But in the more likely cases where this has happened and you just haven't learned about it and the attacker hasn't had a chance to get that information in your submarine, you're still okay. Right, and once again, you have to kind of yes, I know what I'm doing, and I want to take this. So away. generally, don't let people in your submarine with keys unless you've actually checked wh who these people are. <laughs> yes. We. So the some, so the question uh, sorry, is. Sorry, the question the, is, what's the status of support for HSMs in Notary? So, on the. Client side, we support YubiKey um, and because yes, eleven for a long time. Um, on the server side, there's some open PRs that are in progress, which um, and we there's yeah, we've definitely seen a lot more demand for for doing server side stuff with HSM. So that's kind of in progress. IBM have been working on it. Yeah, and the reference implementation has YubiKey support on the client side, and I forget what we have on the server side. We have. Yeah, but we, we also, and other people that are building it are also building the support in, but it's not universal. It's not like mandated by the spec that you have to support these HSMs or something. Any other questions? Yeah. So the question is, how do you learn about revocations? Um, is, do we use OCSP or something like that? And the answer is no. Um, what happens, so o OCSP, as I'm sure you know, has a whole host of problems. And really, any kind of web revocation is not was not designed when they designed the spec. It really came along later and is sort of bolted on in kind of a weird way. And Tough was really designed with that as being core. So when you update your Tough metadata initially, that process is where you learn about, um, and, and when you update it before you're about to do an install or whatever else, that process is where you learn about explicit revocations and also the, pro the point at which you'll check uh, for things like implicit revocations. Has any key timed out or has anybody explicitly revoked things? In fact, if you're interested in revocations and you're interested in issues related to that, uh, Marina Moore, who's one of my PhD students over there, um, she and, and some folks from the OCaml community and myself have been working on um, adding actually a self-revocation and key rotation mechanisms 
uh, into the tough spec. So we've got that in a pretty good format. That's one of our tabs, tab eight, that we think is going to make it into the um, next iteration of the tough spec in a few months. So if you're interested, this is the perfect time to jump in and chat with us about it. Yes. Um, we do have some mailing lists. They tend to be pretty low volume. A lot of the, so really what happens is that uh, there's a lot of separate communities. Like there's kind of the, a lot of the folks in the cloud space work and discuss things. There's folks in like the automotive space that are working and discussing it. And those communities are all pretty like more vibrant. And then when things bubble up to the level that they're going to make it to be a tap where everyone might have to care about it, then we sort of reach out and really link back in all the communities and pull the people together. So um, I, I would be, I, I think there's a couple ways to do it, going to our GitHub and watching the issue tracker, watching what's happening with taps and watching commits there. It's very low um, intentional. I mean, the good thing for a security spec is that it's low churn. You don't constantly have to you know, make changes to your, to your system because um, it's been stable and tested and validated lots of different ways. Uh, but I, I think that engaging in one of the other projects like Notary or even um, just following on what's happening with Tough is a great way to engage with us. Or, uh, okay, uh, so with that, unfortunately, we're out of time. So thank you all. Uh, we appreciate you coming, and uh, feel free to Take come up and ask us a question. Take on Thursday if you have time. Yes, thank you. Bye.